I think I have known about 150 of the Genoa Soros. And I can truly say that I've loved every one of them. They are men of God. They are truly prophets of the Lord. And I have written down their prophecies on occasion and seen them fulfilled. So spoke Elder Joseph Anderson, emeritus member of the First Quorum of the Seventy and secretary to five first presidencies of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. His close associations with prophets and apostles, spanning some 50 years, have been for Elder Anderson the most treasured parts of an outstanding life of service and devotion. Joseph's boyhood was spent on a Utah farm. His parents were hardworking people, his father a railway foreman. But Joseph's ambitions led him away from the farm to higher education at Weber Stake Academy in Ogden, Utah. Future president of the church, David O. McKay, was the then youthful principal of Weber Stake Academy. He was also a popular English teacher. We just loved President McKay. Sometimes he would become so much interested in his uh, lesson, what he's telling us and teaching us, that he wouldn't even hear the bell ring. And we were so glad that he didn't. <laughs> Sometimes we stayed longer than we should. And then at times when we, was, we had a big uh, study room, oh, a large auditorium with desks in there. And as kids usually do, they, we sometimes did a lot of fooling together, I guess, talking together. President McKay would come into the side there, tall, handsome young man. And all he'd do was just look around, just look around. His eyes might, if necessary, they'd set on you. You were making all that trouble. He never had to say a word. I'll tell you, we immediately got busy and <laughs> did our studying, did our working. Joseph completed the two-year commercial course at the academy, becoming particularly proficient at shorthand. The professor told me right in the very beginning, he said, Joseph, you ought to be a court reporter. You have a natural ability. And I did have. It seemed to come natural to me. After a mission and his marriage to Norma Peterson, Joseph put the secretarial skills he had learned at Weber Stake Academy to work at Merchants Bank and later Utah Fuel Company. He had reached a turning point in his life. Well, I made up my mind. If I must write shorthand all my life, and it looked that way, everybody really insisted upon my doing it, I'm going to get the best job in the world <coughs> writing shorthand. And that's the way I felt about it. And I felt the best job in the world writing shorthand was with the president of the church. Well, I knew the president's secretary at that time, who was Melvin D. Wells. So I went up to him and I said, Melvin, don't you have a job up here that, uh, that I can take care of? He says, well, the president does need a man who can travel all over with him, who can take his sermons, who can take care of his accounting, and drive his car, and a few things like that. I said, can you do those things? I said, surely I can do those things. So Brother Wells suggested that I go to the tabernacle and uh, report President Grant's talk in as much as he's going to speak to the young people of the church at the June conference, <clears throat> which I did. And uh, President Grant was a very rapid speaker. And very few reporters could really uh, report his uh, sermons or his talks. Well, I got along all right, even though I had my book on my lap and turned it in, and I'm sure it was satisfactory. So thus far, I was moving along all right. But still, I wasn't getting the position. I was keeping in touch with Mel Wells, and finally I went to him and I said, Brother Wells, I want to talk with the president. I said, I don't, I'm not getting anywhere. Well, he made an appointment with me was the president for me to come and see him. I went to his office and, well, I just fell in love with President Grant immediately. 
he had such a wonderful personality and he treated me so well. One day he called me by telephone one morning. He said, Brother Anderson, I'm going to speak to the students of the uh, LDS University this morning in the assembly hall. This is my birthday. And I, I wish you'd come and report my talk. Well, this is what I've been working for. I thought this was my big opportunity. And so I went. Well, he gave me a drilling. I'm sure he did it purposely. I never heard a man talk so fast. And, uh, oh, he told stories. He quoted poems and uh, uh, told experiences and so forth. Well, I had a real wrestle with <laughs> talk. When I went home that night, my wife said, how did you get along? I said, well, not too well. She said, well, didn't you get his talk? She said, I said, well, I guess over a fa after a fashion. She said, well, let's go to a show and uh, forget all about it tonight, and then tomorrow get into your notes and see what you can do. Well, that's what we did, but I, I don't know what the show was or anything about it. I was thinking, here I've had my opportunity, and I've flunked it. But, uh, well, the next day I got into my notes. I went over to the library, hunted up some of these <laughs> uh, poet, uh, poems that he'd repeated and got them and turned the talk in. And I think that was what turned the trick, as it were. On February 1st, 1922, Elder Anderson became secretary to President Heber J. Grant. So began his nearly 50-year career as secretary to the president and first presidency of the church as well as his intimate association with President Grant. When you travel for a man that closely, that long, you don't just sit and look at each other. He told me all about his life. There was nothing in his life that he didn't tell me over and over again. I'm sure I knew President Grant better than his own family did. As a matter of fact, he said, no two men, I think no two men have been closer to each other than Joseph and I have been. Elder Anderson traveled extensively with President Grant and shared many experiences with him. We went to uh, Dearborn, Michigan on one occasion to talk to the, uh, to a Comergic conference, they called it. We had chemists and scientists from all over the world there. The president was worried about it. He and I went a, a day early and he tried to prepare a talk. You know, he couldn't do it. And the president said, well, I'll just go and speak as I usually do and depend upon the spirit. And, and that's what we did. Well, I was worried about it, as a matter of fact. Of course, I'd been with the president a long time then. And I imagined all these scientists, men of uh, importance from all over the world there, and here's a Mormon prophet coming to speak to them. They think, who claims to be a prophet of the Lord, and he's got a beard, and I thought uh, they would uh, not receive him too well. But you know, when he got up and spoke, I don't think he'd said a dozen words before they were just eating out of his hands, as it were. They were laughing, and they were clapping, and they, they just uh, enjoyed it immensely. He was the star of the day. There was no question about it. When he got through, they all stood up, every man stood up, and they clapped and clapped and clapped. Well, as I walked through the halls of the hotel where the auditorium was, I heard men say, wasn't that man great, man Grant great? Of course, they had others there, too. He was the only speaker at the conference that was invited to speak again at the dinner that they held in the evening. President Grant uh, loved to meet people, and he made a great impression wherever he went. Well, I told him as I when we were coming home after this meeting, I said, President, I was agreeably surprised at the great reception we had. Well, he said, Joseph, long ago I learned that the Lord magnifies his servants. And he certainly did. The Lord magnified him on that occasion in a remarkable way. During President Grant's administration, Elder Anderson was given other responsibilities which he fulfilled for nearly half a century. 
might say that from that time forward, I reported every general conference that was held in the church. And then it uh, became my lot to report the uh, temple dedications. Yes, I did that alone. I'd reported the dedication of the uh, Cardston Temple, the uh, Mesa, Arizona Temple, the Idaho Falls Temple, the Los Angeles Temple, and the Oakland Temple. And so it has been a remarkable experience. But more important, I suppose, than any of these was the fact that oh, about a year after I started to work for President Grant as his secretary, I also became secretary to the First Presidency. So I attended all the uh, meetings of the First Presidency and the Quorum of the Twelve in the temple. Their quorum meetings, council meetings, we call them. From that period on, about a year after I started to work for President Grant, in addition to doing his work, every Thursday I attended all uh, each of those meetings and reported them. During these years as secretary, Elder Anderson became a trusted and beloved friend of President Grant. A day or two before he died, I was up to his home. He said, have I ever been unkind to you? I said, no, President Grant, you've never said an unkind word to me. And that was true. He said, oh, I'm so glad. Well, I was with him for 23 years. And my, how I admired and loved that man. Even, uh, even today, President Grant will never die in light, I guess, because I speak about President Grant so much, being with him so much as I did. Succeeding Heber J. Grant was George Albert Smith, who became president of the church in May 1945. Elder Anderson also traveled with him and remembers an interesting trip to Mexico City. There was a group in Mexico City that had been, that had become di dissident. They wanted to have their own president of the church. They thought the Mexicans should have a Mexican president. And there's some of them that were quite active in this campaign. They really broke away from the church in a sense. They were starting to practice plural marriage and doing other things. Well, President Smith was a man of love. I, Everybody loved President Smith, and he loved everybody. He and I went alone on this particular trip. While there, we called on these people, the leadership, and President uh, Smith made the right kind of impression. And, uh, well, anyway, we dedicated the Ermita Branch Chapel. And there was a large crowd out to that dedication. And, uh, President Grant, uh, President Smith invited the head of this group, the leader of this group, to get up and talk at that service. And in his remarks, he said, there's only one president of this church, and that president is George Albert Smith. From that time on, we never had any more trouble with that group in Mexico. And you can see what has happened. All these wards and stakes have been organized, hundreds not only hundreds, but thousands and tens of thousands of people have joined the church, come into the church. So I say that was a great accomplishment, and it took a George Albert Smith to do it. Though President David O. McKay retained his own personal secretary when he succeeded George Albert Smith in 1951, he asked Elder Anderson to continue in his role as secretary to the First Presidency. Thus, a personal relationship, which had begun in Elder Anderson's boyhood, continued. The president and I had been acquainted for many years, and uh, I had a close association with him. I remember President Lyndon Johnson particularly came on different occasions to see President McKay. And I heard him personally, I heard him say, if I could only be with that man more, I'd be a better man than I am. And others the same way. They all made, he made a great impression on all of them. He was a man who loved his wife very dearly. And on occasion, when we'd go to the temple and he wasn't well but wanted to go and did go, what happened? We'd get out into the hall to take the elevator down. 
He says, wait a minute. He says, I've got to go back. I've forgotten something. And he'd go back and kiss Sister McKay goodbye. And, and they were very, very affectionate with each other. And he loved his family and he loved his wife. During the April 1970 General Conference, in which Joseph Fielding Smith was sustained as ninth president of the church, Elder Anderson was approached by Harold B. Lee, then president of the Quorum of Twelve Apostles. The first day of the conference, after the afternoon meeting, President Lee said to me, Joseph, uh, we're going over to the temple. We'd like you to come and go along. Well, I... I didn't think anything about that because I always, I knew there was going to be a new apostle chosen. And I always went with the brethren to the temple when that, such a thing happened. And so I knew that, uh, that uh, there was such an opening and was glad to go. I was sitting at the desk in the room on the fourth floor where the council meets. When they discussed the matter, they talked about the new apostle and and Reformate uh, took the action necessary in connection therewith. Then they said it's been decided to appoint three more assistants to the twelve. And, uh, and he named me as first, Joseph Anderson. Well, when he said Joseph Anderson, I was sitting there taking notes, and my pen almost fell out of my hand. Well, they went on and discussed the matter, and then Brother Lee said that he was in char charge of the meeting. President Smith was there. He says, now, Joseph, if you've got your breath, we'd like to hear a few words from you. <laughs> and that was my introduction to becoming a general authority of the church. And, uh, well, it was a great change. I, I wondered why, in a sense, that they would call me. I had been a secretary all my life. And I think I was a good secretary. I have a reputation of being a very good one anyway. And I enjoyed it immensely. But now, to call me to be a general authority, to go out and preach the gospel to the various, uh, the people in the various stakes and missions, to set in order the church, as it were. Well, it was a great experience. When I went home, my wife asked me if anything new had happened. Uh, at the conference, I said, well, one, one little thing has happened. And I told them about my call. And we all prayed about the matter. And I told my family, a number of the family happened to be in the home at the time. I said, now, this isn't only a call to me. Uh, this is a call to all of you. You're a part of me, in a sense. You're my family. And so you've all got to Remember that we are in the family of the leadership of the church. Elder Anderson was comforted and confirmed in his new calling by an old friend now departed. I had a dream about President McKay. Oh, I'm not much of a dreamer. But I think this was a serious dream. I dreamt I saw President McKay. I had just been made a general authority. I dreamt I saw President McKay, and he was youthful and stalwart and handsome, just as I knew him to be when we went to school together. And he, with others, was discussing some certain matter, some certain appointment that was to be made. And uh, he made the statement that I, Joseph Anderson, was to do that. So I've always felt, I may be wrong, maybe in just, it was just a dream, I've always felt that he had a little influence in my call to be a general authority of the church. Because it seemed like that there were others who were talked about, but he's not, well, Joseph Anderson is to have that position. Though more than 80 years of age when this call came, Elder Anderson carried out this new phase of church service vigorously and enthusiastically. As one of the assistants to the Twelve, Joseph Anderson was to become a member of the First Quorum of the Seventy. Frequently when I came home, re realizing as she did that I was kind of an, an old person, in years at least, 
My daughter, once she'd meet me at the airport and say, Dad, aren't you tired? I'd say, no, I'm not tired. And I wasn't. I didn't feel old. I didn't feel handicapped because of being 80 years of age. I felt like a young man. But I can testify that the Lord magnified me in a marvelous way. His Spirit has been with me and guided and directed me. And my, it was certainly the greatest experience that one could have. Yes, I thought I had the best job in the church when I was secretary of the First Presidency, but this was different. This was different. To call on the leadership of the church throughout the stakes and missions. And oh, I learned what wonderful people we have in the church. Those men who preside over the stakes and the missions, they were truly men of God, men of inspiration. As an emeritus general authority, Elder Anderson maintained his active lifestyle. Many people, when they see me now on the streets or elsewhere, ask me if I'm still swimming. <laughs> and I'm glad to be able to say yes, that I still go over to the Deseret Gym two or three times a week and enjoy it. Someone asked me one day, how long have you been swimming? I said, oh, oh about 85 years. Today, uh, I don't swim nearly so far as I used to, but normally, when I go to the swimming pool, I swim 20 lengths. And when I was 90 years of age, the brethren were kind enough to make a pack of me and saying something about my swimming and placing it on the wall of the swimming pool in the desert gym. Elder Joseph Anderson a friend and confidant of prophets, a tireless and faithful steward who through his dedicated service to the leaders of the Savior's Church has truly become a friend of the Lord. I've always loved the brethren, and I hope they've always loved me. I think it's one of the greatest uh, tributes one can have is to have the love of the general authorities of the Church. My experience has taught me that uh, they are men of God, that they are in tune with the Lord. And I've always tried to follow that. And I think the worst thing that people can do sometimes is to criticize the brethren, particularly the president of the church, thinking that they know more about the gospel, know more about the Lord's work than, than the president does. They're on dangerous grounds. So you won't make, they won't make any mistake if you just follow their counsel. I've done that these many years, and so far as I know, they've always been right.